Uh, good morning everyone. I am Dr. Orlan Joshua Limbuyugen, an orthopedic surgeon practicing here in Ilogos Norte. Today I'll be lecturing to you about the basics in orthopedics. For the outline of our lecture, first I'll be discussing about orthopedic tissues from bone, cartilage, muscle, tendon, ligament, to biomaterials and biomechanics. Specific to orthopedics. So for the types of bone, we have two types according to microscopic appearance. You have uh, lamellar bone and woven bone. For the subtypes of lamellar bone, you have cortical and cancellous. Cortical bone is usually found in uh, shafts of uh, long bones, while for the cancellous type of bone, it's usually found in the ends of long bones. For the characteristics, usually for cortical, you have a structure oriented toward line of stress. It has a slower turnover rate compared to cancellous bone. It's stiffer and it has a higher young elastic of modulus. For cancellous bone, it usually has a higher turnover rate and it is less dense. The next type would be for woven bone, you have immature bone, which is usually found in pediatric patients. So immature bone is usually not stress oriented. It can also be found in fracture callus. So when a fracture is, when a, when a patient has a fracture, uh, the body tries to attempt to heal itself and usually we find a fracture callus and it's composed of woven or immature bone. The next type is pathologic, which has a random organization, increased bone turnover, as well as uh, the following characteristics, which is it's usually weak and flexible. So after discussing about the types of bone, we'll be next discussing about the cellular bi biology, which includes um, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, osteocytes, and the uh, and the characteristics or the, the, the interactions that they have with each other. So for mesenchymal stem cells, these are usually, um, they, these become osteoblasts under conditions of low strain and ox increased oxygen tension. They become cartilage under conditions of intermediate strain and low oxygen tension. And they become fibrous tissue under conditions of high strain. That's why uh, I included the term orthopedic gardening because when we try to uh, fix a fracture, we try, to, uh, we try to increase the oxygen tension by not violating the periosteum of the bone, by not violating the, the soft tissue covering, and we also increase or we decrease the strain in the environment by fixing the bone, right? By as much as possible perfecting the end-to-end -end contact between the bones. The next type of cell that we have would be, of course, the osteoblast. So the osteoblast usually lines the surface of the matrix. So they appear as cuboid cells aligned in layers along immature osteoid. And they're usually uh, meta more metabolically active compared to those uh, osteocytes that have been entrapped underneath the matrix. So the characteristic of osteoblasts is that their cellular activity is determined by their location. So when you find them in bone surfaces, they are more differentiated and they are more metabolically active. But when you find them entrapped, they, are, they become less active in the resting regions and they maintain the ionic milieu of the bone. However, uh, when acted on by osteoclasts, when you have disruption of the active lining cell, uh, the entrapped cells again become exposed, so they, they again become uh, more metabolically active. So as you can see for their characteristics, they usually have more endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, and mitochond mitochondria, which is important for synthesis and the secretion of the matrix. The next cell we have would be osteocyte. So the osteocyte are former osteoblasts trapped in matrix and they are important for the extracellular calcium and phosphorus concentration. 
Next, we have the osteoclast. So, the osteoclast compared to the osteoblast and osteocyte, they originate from myeloid hematopoietic cells from monocyte or macrophage cell lineage. So, they have a different cell lineage compared to the other types of uh, bone cells that we see. So, these monocyte progenitors usually fuse together to form a mature multinuclear cell. So, you could see the image of the mono the the osteoclast it has a multi it's multinucleated and usually its function is to reabsorb bone which are usually occurs at the ruffle border now this is what i was talking to you about uh, the cellular crosstalk between the cells so as you can see a mature osteocyte usually inhibits a formation or inhibits um, osteoblasts by uh, secreting what we call a sclerostin. It helps uh, in the negative feedback on osteoblast bone deposition. So it tries to stop the osteoblasts from uh, forming more bone on the surface of the from from forming more bone on the surface. And then uh, you also have osteoblasts and tumor cells which express rank ligand. So this rank ligand binds to receptors on osteoclasts which stimulates differentiation into mature osteoclasts. This is uh, inhibited by OPG or osteoprotegerin which binds to rank ligand. We also have WNT proteins that promote osteoblast survival and proliferation. That's why if you have deficient WNT, it causes osteopenia while excessive WNT expression causes high bone mass. So WNT can be sequestered by sclerostin and decoff related proteins or DKK1. So the next uh, topic that we'll be talking about will be uh, the types of matrix that are produced. So you have uh, either organic matrix or inorganic matrix. Uh, the more predominant organic matrix that you would see in bone would be collagen. It provides the tensile strength in bone and it's compo it composes 90% of the organic matrix that you would see in bone. The next we'll have uh, pro proteoglycans which gives some compressive strength and it inhibits mineralization. Uh, the third one would be matrix proteins which uh, function for mineralization and bone formation. And we have three types. We have osteocalcin, which attracts osteoclasts. We have osteonectin, or the spark, spark, which is postulated to have a role in calcium and mineral regulation. We also have osteopontin, which is a cell binding protein. And the growth factors, which aid in bone turnover. So they're composed of uh, tumor growth factor beta, insulin-like growth factor, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. So they are present in small amounts in the bone matrix. So for the inorganic matrix, it's, uh, it composes 60% of the dry weight of bone. So it's composed of two. We have a calcium hydroxyapatite, which gives the primary compressive strength of bone. And we also have costrocalcium phosphate. So for the next one, after bone, we have cartilage and joint. So for cartilage, we'll be discussing about the hyaline cartilage as well as the zones that you would see in the cartilage. After which, we'll be discussing synovial fluid, meniscus, and then we'll be going towards skeletal muscle anatomy. So for cartilage and joint, uh, it's composed of usually we have hyaline cartilage, which is usually found in the articular bearing surface of bone. So water actually um, composes approximately 75% of cartilage and it's usually found at the superficial zone or the uh, superficial layer of the cartilage. So it's important for nutri nutrition and lubrication of um, cartilage. Next, we have collagen. So collagen is important because it makes up approximately 50, 15% of the wet weight or 60% of the, 
of the dry weight of the hyaline cartilage. And the next layer you would see proteoglycans, which is important because it, it actually um, gives compression strength to hyaline cartilage. It uh, acts as a sponge because it traps and holds water. And the most common that you would usually see would be agrican. Okay. So hyaline cartilage is important because it's the shock absorber of um, the, the joints. So it has the following properties, which is that uh, it's viscoelastic, it has anisotropic properties, and it has biphasic properties. However, you'd see it's a vascular, aneural, and a lymphatic which means that the, the water in the cartilage is the one that's important in order to preserve the hyaline cartilage. Uh, so it's mostly composed of chondrocytes, which makes up um, 1 to 5% of the wet weight of the uh, hyaline cartilage. So again, it's uh, chondrocytes are derived from undifferentiated mesenchymal pre precursors, just like bone just like osteoblasts and osteocytes so uh, the primary cilia are the mechanosensory organs or the antennae for the cells which means that um, they produce uh, chondrocytes actually produce the extracellular matrix of collagen and proteoglycans so next we'll be discussing the layers or the zones of cartilage and joint so earlier I was talking to you about what the zones are composed of. The superficial zone com composing more of water. Then you have the pericellular zone which composes decorin and type 6 collagen. And then we have proteoglycans in the deep zone. And then finally on the calcified zone you already have hypertrophic chondrocytes. So zone 1 composes 10 to 20% of the total thickness. So it's also called the tangential zone. So you would usually see flat chondrocytes in this area uh, with the highest concentration of collagen fibers which are parallel to joint surface. So it's uh, important for shear strength. And it has the this zone has the greatest tensile stiffness compared to the other zones. So for zone 2, uh, which composes 40 to 60% of the thickness, uh, the collagen fibers are more and less dense. So as you would see in the diagram, uh, they have high levels of water and proteoglycan. For zone 3, which is the deep zone, it composes 30% uh, of the total thickness of uh, the hyaline cartilage. It has a lower water content compared to the other two but it has the highest concentration of proteoglycan it has chondrocytes and collagen fibers but are these are arranged perpendicular to the um, articular surface the last zone would be the calcified cartilage zone so it actually begins at the tide mark so you would see here on the right side so transitions to become stiffer from flexible cartilage to rigid subchondral bone and it's usually where we find type X collagen. So next we'll be discussing about the other structures that are important for supporting joints which would be uh, synovial fluid and meniscus. So, so for synovial fluid uh, these are important because it's a uh, it's actually composed of ultrafiltrate of plasma so it's a non-newtonian fluid which means that it's uh, important for shear thinning so it decreases the friction between the between the joints so it's it actually has uh, it actually ha has a better it, it has better characteristics at this compared to most motor oils that you would see, think you would see or most man-made products that you would see. The next one would be the meniscus which is composed of 90% of type 1 collagen 
it is composed of fibroelastic cartilage and you would usually see fibrochondrocytes in these areas. So fibrochondrocytes are important for meniscal healing and more or less they are more elastic and less permeable than articular cartilage or hyaline cartilage. So the blood in these areas is usually supplied only on the peripheral 25% of the knee meniscus. So it means that the uh, inner layer, inner 75% of the knee meniscus is actually a vascular and it and only synovial fluid supplies the inner 75% of the knee meniscus. However, you usually find nerve fibers around the peripheral two-thirds of the meniscus. That's why when you have pathologies regarding the meniscus, uh, you would still see patients with knee pain even if that area is actually avascular. Next, we'll be discussing about skeletal muscle anatomy. So this is the, uh, for skeletal muscle anatomy, you, you remember the sarcolemma from anatomy, from your anatomy lessons. So the sarcolemma is actually the plasma membrane surrounding the cell. And then for the basic functional unit for muscle contraction, we have the sarcomere, which is composed of the following bands, the A band, I band, H band, M line, and the Z line. So the A band, contains both actin and myosin, I band or the thin band contains actin only, the H band contains myosin only. The M line is the one that interconnects uh, sites of the thick filaments and the Z line is anchors the thin filaments together. So a myofibril is actually a set of sarcomeres which is parallel to the axis of the cell and it's usually 1 to 3 micrometers in diameter and one uh, micrometer cent or one micrometer long so the next covering that you would usually see would be the fascia which is a tough connective tissue covering the muscle and which allows sliding the next we have epimysium with a more delicate surrounds the bundle of fascicles and then the perimysium which surrounds the individual muscle fascicles and then finally, we have the endomysium, which surrounds individual myofibers. Next, we'll be discussing about the types of muscle. So we have three types, type 1, type 2A, and type 2B. So for the type 1, we have slow twitch oxidative red fibers. So the mnemonic usually used for these ones would be the slow red ox. So type 1 uh, muscle is usually aerobic. It has more mitochondria, enzymes, and triglycerides, which she uses at, as energy source than type 2 fibers. Uh, it, however, has uh, low concentrations of glycogen and glycolytic enzymes, or ATPase. So it enables us to perform endurance activities, posture, and balance, and they are the first to be lost without rehabilitation. The next one would be the fast twitch or glycolytic white fibers which are anaerobic. They contract more quickly and have larger stronger motor units than type 1 fibers. So they are less efficient than type 1 but with large amount of force per cross-sectional area and have high contraction speeds and quick relaxation times. So these are the ones that we usually see in bodybuilders or in sprint runners. So remember there are two types of type 2A and type 2B. The difference would be that uh, type 2B is usually just fast glycolytic whereas type 2A usually has oxidative phosphorylation as an energy source. So type 2B is highly fatigable and has the largest motor unit size compared to the type 2A. Uh, next, we'll be discussing about tendons. So, tendons are composed of tenocytes or fibroblasts, which are again derived from mesoderm. They function to synthesize ECM, collagen, and proteoglycans. And they assemble early collagen fibrils and produce MMPs or matrix degrading enzymes. So they are composed of around 50 to 60 percent of water and the much, most of the dry weight is uh, 
collagen type 1, but they also have a minimal amount of collagen type 3. So, uh, tendons have what we call, uh, uh, what they have a highly elastic protein that allows the tendons to resume their shape after stretching. So, it has a triple helix of collagen organized into microfibrils, fibrils, fascicles, and then into the tendons. So, there are, um, for tendons, you have a triple helix uh, composed of two alpha-1 chains and one alpha-2 chain. And they are, these, uh, this triple helix is organized into microfibrils, and then fibrils, fascicles, and then finally tendons. Next, we have the ligament, which is a similar composition to tendon. Again, uh, most of its dry, uh, most of its weight is water, fifty to sixty percent. And then again, we have a collagen type one composing ninety five percent of the collagen, and type three comp composing around just five percent. And we have elastin. So the major difference with tendon is that it has less total collagen but with more type 3 collagen, more proteoglycans, and therefore more water content. It has a uniform microvascularity which receives supply by epiligamentous plexuses. So next we have uh, uh, on our lecture, we are on part 2. Uh, we have biomaterials and biomechanics. So, in order to understand the materials that we use, uh, we have the term called Young's Elastic Modulus of Elasticity, which means that, uh, and in order to understand it, we need to define the following terms, which is stress. So, stress is the internal resistance of body to load. So, it is equal to force over area. And then we also have the two types of stress, which is compressive stress. We have tension and we have shear. So the usual thing that you would see would be compression stress. So it's when you try to push an object towards the wall, that's, is, that's compressive stress. Uh, what, you have tension when you, have, when you try to pull an object stuck to a wall. Uh, for shear stress, it's when you try to move an object across the wall. So, Young's elastic modulus of elasticity, uh, you also have the term what we call strain, which is the change in length compared to the original length. And strain is usually pro a proportion and has no units. So, when you think of, a, for example, of a plastic object, when you try to bend the plastic object, usually uh, uh, after several sessions of bending, it will break. So that is what we call strain. So that is uh, the when you when an object breaks, that's called the breaking point. But when an object just deforms, that's what you call the uh, yield point up to the the ultimate strength of the object. So E for Young's elastic of mod Young's modulus of elasticity is actually equal to stress over strain. So it's a measure of material stiffness and it's a measure of the material's ability to resist deformation in tension. So we have different objects that we use in orthopedics and we usually compare their uh, modulus of elasticity. So as you can see Titanium is the one we usually use now, so it's rapid. It rapidly forms. The advantage of which is that it rapidly forms an adherent oxide coating or self passivation, which decreases corrosion inside the body, and it mostly um, most closely emulates axial and torsional stiffness of bone. It has a higher yield strength. As you can see, titanium is number four, while cortical bone is number five. When you compare that with the uh, stainless steel, stainless steel has a higher uh, modulus of elasticity, but it's in it, but it's not comparable to cortical bone. That's why we prefer now to use titanium compared to 
stainless steel. Next, we'll be discussing biomechanics. So, for biomechanics, what I want you to remember would be the position of fusion or orthodesis. So, this is orthodesis, man. So, these are the positions of fusion that you usually have or that you usually uh, position patients in when we can no longer restore the joint line. So, these are important in order to maintain the ADLs or the activities of daily living. So, for the hip joint, it's usually 25 to 30 degrees of flexion with 0 degrees of abduction rotation. For the knee, you have 0 to 7 degrees of valgus with 10 to 15 degrees of flexion. For the ankle, it's usually 5 degrees of hind foot valgus with 5 to 10 degrees of external rotation and neutral dorsiflexion. For shoulder joint, you have 15 to 20 degrees of abduction and 20 to 25 degrees of forward flexion, 40 degrees of internal rotation. For elbow, uh, it's important to note that if we have only a unilateral arthrodesis, uh, we usually position the elbow at 90 degrees of flexion. But if it's bilateral, uh, we position one joint at 65 degrees and the other one at 110 degrees. For the wrist joint, we position it usually at 10 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion, but if bilateral, then we position, uh, the position should be in 10 degrees of palmar flexion. So next we'll be discussing biomechanics. So for hip biomechanics, the largest joint in our body, uh, this, it has the following range of motion. So for flexion, it's, it has 115 to uh, average range. And uh, the functional range is usually 90. But if you position the patient to squat, it's usually 120 degrees. So it also has the other uh, ranges for extension you have 30 degrees for abduction it has 50 degrees adduction 30 degrees internal rotation at 45 degrees and external rotation at 45 degrees so the ball and socket joint or the ball and socket configuration of the hip usually provides the most stability comparing that to the shoulder joint so the next we have knee biomechanics. The range of motion is usually 10 degrees of extension or recurvatum. And then you also have 130 degrees of flexion. So when the, the, when the knee is fully extended, you usually find no rotation. However, when the knee is 90 degrees flex, the rotation is 45 degrees external rotation and 30 degrees of internal rotation. Uh, one important thing to note about the knee is that it has what we call the screw home mechanism in which the femur rotates internally during the last 15 degrees of extension. So for the knee, uh, for the knee we have different stabilizers. For the medial, we have the superficial, MCL, the lateral, we have the joint capsule and the LCL. Anterior, primarily, we have the ACL, posterior, the PCL, and for rotatory, it has the combination of uh, mostly the MCL for external rotation and ACL for internal rotation. Comparing that to the hip, which has no, uh, no ligaments to stabilize it except for its um, ball and socket. Next, we have ankle biomechanics. So the talus is usually uh, what we would see at the distal uh, aspect of the tibia. So the talus, as you would see, is cone-shaped. So it provides, because of the shape, it provides a dorsiflexion of around 25 degrees, plantar flexion of 35 degrees, and rotation of 5 degrees. So the instant center of rotation in the ankle joint is usually in the talus. And when we, we say uh, that the talus is cone-shaped, it means that the body and trochlea is actually wider com anteriorly and laterally compared to the posterior aspect. So the talus and the fibula usually externally rotates slightly with dorsiflexion. 
So the tibiotalar joint is the major articulate is the major weight bearing surface of the ankle and actually supports compressive forces up to five times the body weight. So next we have spine biomechanics. As you can see, the instant center of rotation of uh, every vertebral body is usually in the disc. So for the thoracic spine, we have a th normal thoracic kyphosis of around 30 to 50 degrees. And for a lumbar lordosis, usually of around the same 45 degrees. Uh, for the for the for the other measurements you have the following you have the sacral slope which is the which is the angle from the transverse up to the end surface of the s1 and you also have the pelvic tilt which is from the center of the s1 towards the center of the femur and then you also have the pelvic incidence, which measures the angle actually of the uh, center of the femur towards the back end or of the, the posterior surface of the sacrum. So the cervical spine facets usually are oriented 45 degrees, as you would see here, uh, to the transverse plane. So it means that when you draw... Uh, horizontal line from the from the floor or parallel to the floor then the facet joint is usually oriented 45 degrees for the cervical spine you have 60 degrees to, for the thoracic spine and then 90 degrees for the lumbar spine Next, we have the shoulder joint or the shoulder biomechanics. Oh, I forgot to discuss about, I will be first discussing about the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus, which are components of the disc. So the nucleus pulposus is the center portion of the disc. So it resists compression force, while the annulus fibrosus provides tensile strength. So the more important thing to note would be that these pressures are lowest when lying down compared to when uh, sitting. The highest is when sitting and, and your hands are on the table compared to, uh, compared to standing or when you are trying to slouch. So for shoulder biomechanics, uh, the, glen the glenohumeral joint provides actually up to two-thirds of the motion while the scapulothoracic joint up provides one-third of the motion of the, to of the shoulder. So that's in ratio of two is to one. The stability is provided primarily by the anterior band of the IGHL or the inferior glenohumeral ligament while the superior and middle glenohumeral ligaments are the secondary stabilizers to anterior humeral translation. So when, when you, you try to notice, when you try to abduct your shoulder, uh, full abduction actually requires external rotation of the humerus. So try to, so when you're trying to lift your shoulder, you actually need to uh, face your palm forwards in order to fully extend the shoulder or fully abduct the shoulder because it actually prevents uh, the greater what we call greater tuberosity impingement with internal rotation but with internal rotation contractures abduction is actually only limited to 120 degrees because patients with internal rotation contractures cannot uh, externally rotate the humerus for the final um, 60 degrees of rotation. Next, we have um, elbow biomechanics. For the elbow, you have 0 to 150 degrees of flexion extension with 30 to 130 degrees of functional range of motion. And the axis of rotation is usually found in the trochlea. For pronation and supination, you only have 80, 80 degrees pronation, 85 degrees supination, uh, with functional pronation and supination at 50 degrees each. 
So the most important um, for the stabilizers of the elbow joint, these are the three more important ones. You have the coronoid tip, the anterior MCL, and LCL. The most important secondary stabilizer against vagus stress would of course be the radial head. And in extension, the capsule is the primary restraint to distraction forces. So again, the anterior band of the MCL is the most important anterior of, uh, stabilizer against uh, both valgus angulation and distraction force at uh, 90 degrees. Okay. So this is it for basics in orthopedics. So it, uh, I'll see you again next week for our lecture on upper extremity anatomy. Thank you.